Section 11 of Further Chronicles of Avonlea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Further Chronicles of Avonlea by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 6 The Brother Who Failed, Part 1. The Monroe family were holding a Christmas reunion at the old Prince Edward Island homestead at White Sands. It was the first time they had all been together under one roof since the death of their mother, thirty years before. The idea of this Christmas reunion had originated with Edith Monroe the preceding spring, during her tedious convalescence from a bad attack of pneumonia among strangers in an American city, where she had not been able to fill her concert engagements and had more spare time in which to feel the tug of old ties and the homesick longing for her own people than she had had for years. As a result, when she recovered, she wrote to her second brother, James Monroe, who lived on the homestead, and the consequence was this gathering of the Monroes under the old roof tree. Ralph Monroe for once laid aside the cares of his railroads and the deceitfulness of his millions in Toronto and took the long-promised, long-deferred trip to the homeland. Malcolm Monroe journeyed from the far western university of which he was president. Edith came, flushed with the triumph of her latest and most successful concert tour. Mrs. Woodburn, who had been Margaret Monroe, came from the Nova Scotia town where she lived a happy, busy life as the wife of a rising young lawyer. James, prosperous and hardy, greeted them warmly at the old homestead whose fertile acres had well repaid his skillful management. They were a merry party, casting aside their cares and years, and harking back to joyous boyhood and girlhood once more. James had a family of rosy lads and lasses. Margaret brought her two blue-eyed little girls. Ralph's dark, clever-looking son accompanied him, and Malcolm brought his, a young man with a resolute face, in which there was less of boyishness than in his father's, and the eyes of a keen, perhaps hard bargainer. The two cousins were the same age to a day, and it was a family joke among the Monroes that the stork must have mixed the babies, since Ralph's son was like Malcolm in face and brain, while Malcolm's boy was a second edition of his uncle Ralph. To crown all, Aunt Isabel came, too, a talkative, clever, shrewd old lady, as young at eighty-five as she had been at thirty, thinking the Monroe stock the best in the world and beamingly proud of her nephews and nieces, who had gone out from this humble little farm to destinies of such brilliance and influence in the world beyond. I have forgotten Robert. Robert Monroe was apt to be forgotten. Although he was the oldest of the family, White Sands people, in naming over the various members of the Monroe family, would add, and Robert, in a tone of surprise over the remembrance of his existence. He lived on a poor, sandy little farm down by the shore, but he had come up to James's place on the evening when the guests arrived. They had all greeted him warmly and joyously, and then did not think about him again in their laughter and conversation. Robert sat back in a corner and listened with a smile, but he never spoke. Afterwards he had slipped noiselessly away and gone home, and nobody noticed his going. They were all gaily busy recalling what had happened in the old times and telling what had happened in the new. Edith recounted the success of her concert tours, Malcolm expatiated proudly on his plans for developing his beloved college, Ralph described the country through which his new railroad ran, and the difficulties he had had to overcome in connection with it. James, aside, discussed his orchard and his crops with Margaret, who had not been long enough away from the farm to lose touch with its interests. Aunt Isabel knitted and smiled complacently on all, talking now with one, now with the other, secretly proud of herself that she, an old woman of eighty-five, who had seldom been out of white sands in her life, could discuss high finance with Ralph and higher education with Malcolm, and hold her own with James in an argument on drainage. The white sand school teacher, an arch-eyed, red-mouthed bit of a girl, a belle from Avonlea, who boarded with the James Monroes, amused herself with the boys. All were enjoying themselves hugely, so it is not to be wondered that they did not miss Robert, who had gone home early because his old housekeeper was nervous if left alone at night. He came again the next afternoon. From James in the barnyard he learned that Malcolm and Ralph had driven to the harbor, that Margaret and Mrs. James had gone to call on friends in Avonlea, and that Edith was walking somewhere in the woods on the hill. 
There was nobody in the house except Aunt Isabel and the teacher. "'You'd better wait and stay the evening,' said James, indifferently. "'They'll all be back soon.' Robert went across the yard and sat down on the rustic bench in the angle of the front porch. It was a fine December evening, as mild as autumn. There had been no snow, and the long fields, sloping down from the homestead, were brown and mellow. A weird, dreamy stillness had fallen upon the purple earth, the windless woods, the rain of the valleys, the sear meadows. Nature seemed to have folded satisfied hands to rest, knowing that her long, wintry slumber was coming upon her. Out to sea, a dull red sunset faded out into somber clouds, and the ceaseless voice of many waters came up from the tawny shore. Robert rested his chin on his hands and looked across the vales and hills, where the feathery gray of leafless hardwoods was mingled with the sturdy, unfailing green of the cone-bearers. He was a tall, bent man with thin gray hair, a lined face, and deeply set, gentle brown eyes, the eyes of one who, looking through pain, sees rapture beyond. He felt very happy. He loved his family clannishly, and he was rejoiced that they were all again near to him. He was proud of their success and fame. He was glad that James had prospered so well of late years. There was no canker of envy or discontent in his soul. He heard absently indistinct voices at the open hall window above the porch, where Aunt Isabel was talking to Kathleen Bell. Presently Aunt Isabel moved nearer to the window, and her words came down to Robert with startling clearness. "'Yes, I can assure you, Miss Bell, that I'm real proud of my nephews and nieces. They're a smart family. They've almost all done well, and they hadn't any of them much to begin with. Ralph had absolutely nothing, and today he is a millionaire. Their father met with so many losses that with his ill health and the bank failing that he couldn't help them any. But they've all succeeded, except poor Robert, and I must admit that he's a total failure.' "'Oh, no, no,' said the little teacher, deprecatingly. "'A total failure,' Aunt Isabel repeated her words emphatically. "'She was not going to be contradicted by anybody, least of all a bell from Avonlea. "'He has been a failure since the time he was born. "'He is the first Monroe to disgrace the old stock that way. "'I'm sure his brothers and sisters must be dreadfully ashamed of him. "'He has lived sixty years, and he hasn't done a thing worthwhile. "'He can't even make his farm pay.' If he's kept out of debt, it's as much as he's ever managed to do. Some men can't even do that, murmured the little school teacher. She was really so much in awe of this imperious, clever old Aunt Isabel that it was positive heroism on her part to venture even this faint protest. More is expected of a Monroe, said Aunt Isabel majestically. Robert Monroe is a failure, and that is the only name for him. Robert Monroe stood up below the window in a dizzy, uncertain fashion. Aunt Isabel had been speaking of him. He, Robert, was a failure, a disgrace to his blood, of whom his nearest and dearest were ashamed. Yes, it was true, he had never realized it before. He had known he could never win power or accumulate riches, but he had not thought that mattered much. Now, through Aunt Isabel's scornful eyes, he saw himself as the world saw him, as his brothers and sisters must see him. There lay the sting. What the world thought of him did not matter, but that his own should think him a failure and disgrace was agony. He moaned as he started to walk across the yard, only anxious to hide his pain and shame away from all human sight, and in his eyes was the look of a gentle animal which had been stricken by a cruel and unexpected blow. Edith Monroe, who, unaware of Robert's proximity, had been standing on the other side of the porch, saw that look as he hurried past her unseeing. A moment before her dark eyes had been flashing with anger at Aunt Isabel's words. Now the anger was drowned in a sudden rush of tears. She took a quick step after Robert, but checked the impulse. Not then, and not by her alone, could that deadly hurt be healed. Nay, more, Robert must never suspect that she knew of any hurt. She stood and watched him through her tears as he went away across the low-lying fields to hide his broken heart under his own humble roof. She yearned to hurry after him and comfort him, but she knew that comfort was not what Robert needed now. Justice, and justice only, could pluck out the sting, which otherwise must rankle to the death. Ralph and Malcolm were driving into the yard. Edith went over to them. "'Boys,' she said resolutely, "'I want to have a talk with you.' 
The Christmas dinner at the old homestead was a merry one. Mrs. James spread a feast that was fit for the halls of Lucullus. Laughter, jest, and repartee flew from lip to lip. Nobody appeared to notice that Robert ate little, said nothing, and sat with his form shrinking in his shabby best suit, his gray head bent even lower than usual, as if desirous of avoiding all observation. When the others spoke to him, he answered deprecatingly, and shrank still further into himself. End of section 11